Thank you for the invitation to share our research results with, uh, with all of you. I uh, want to talk about a couple of things today, specific biomarkers of both sensitivity and exposure to organophosphorus compounds. And same, some of the same uh, biomarkers uh, are involved in susceptibility to vascular disease and neurodegenerative diseases. So up front, uh, the uh, Tech Transfer Office and Dean require me to state any possible conflicts of interest. So some of our research has been supported by NICO in Paris, a manufacturer of jet engine lubricants, and the only company to date that's taken the issue on straight away rather than trying to push it under the carpet. And we've received gifts from uh, pilot and crew unions to help with this work as well. And the UW has filed a provisional patent uh, for the PON1 status assays that will probably lapse into the public domain. So our goals in exploring biomarkers are, biomarkers are first to look at biomarkers of susceptibility. Why are some individuals more susceptible than others to specific disease or an environmental exposure? Uh, how do you know that a given biomarker for susceptibility to disease really has validity? We'll talk a bit about that and how to approach that with an animal model. And biomarkers of exposure, this has become very important. How do you know if an individual's been exposed to a given toxicant, an OP pesticide, a nerve agent, or a trichrysal phosphate? And I should mention that the CDC really has a mandate to be able to identify exposures very, very rapidly, and we're working with them uh, to help them do that, and hopefully some of that will transfer to lab medicine here. So uh, we'll take a specific example of biomarkers of uh, sensitivity, and these are the PON genes on chromosome 7. These are the genes that were first used to map the cystic fibrosis gene, actually. So the first protein that was worked on was paraoxinase 1, and that came out of work on organophosphorus pesticides. And uh, PON1 inactivates a number of organophosphorus toxins, some only in the test tube and some are uh, physiologically significant. And both PON1 and PON3 are found in the HDL particle. And PON2 is quite different. It's ubiquitously expressed intracellularly, both in the ER and in mitochondria in the inner membrane. And it plays a rather unique role in apoptosis. It can sequester the quorum sensing factors or hydrolyzed quorum sensing factors, but it can also sequester coenzyme Q10 and relieve the cell of oxidative stress and prevent it from going into apoptosis and interfere with some of the chemotherapies for cancer. And if you specifically knock it down, then those cell lines become susceptible to the chemotherapeutics. So it's quite interesting, but we won't have time to talk about that today. And all three of the ponds can be considered as modulators of oxidative stress, among their other activities. So properties of human paroxinase 1, or PON1, it's an HDL-associated plasma enzyme. All of you have it. And... Uh, some, some of you may have very low levels and some very high levels, and you'll learn uh, quite a bit about what uh, your PON status may mean today, I hope. So PON1 metabolizes toxic organophosphorus insecticides and nerve agents. Uh, the nerve agent's not physiologically significant, but uh, can be engineered to do so. And that's Stephanie Suzuki's project. It, uh, all three PONs, uh, including PON1, uh, uh, clean up oxidized lipids. And interestingly, uh, various ponds are involved in drug metabolism, either activating drugs, uh, uh, the bioprecursor drugs, or inactivating some, and like the glu glucocorticoids, confining, confining their state of action to the, to the site of application. And more recently, and these are sort of historically uh, the areas that uh, were uncovered uh, as pond functions, uh, quorum sensing factors popped out uh, most recently from some of the work uh, from Pete Greenberg and his colleagues at Iowa, Joe Zabner and crew. So we'll take first a look at the organophosphorus insecticides, which were the first uh, compounds looked at. Paraoxinase received its name from its ability to hydrolyze paraoxone, the toxic metabolite of parathione. And it's really a misnomer because uh, your pond status doesn't do you any good uh, for resistance, as we'll see. 
So your cytochromes P450, microsomal oxidases, turn these uh, sulfur compounds, they're manufactured as phosphorothioates, and those are turned by the P450s with an oxidative desulfuration into very, very toxic oxone compounds that inhibit serine esterases, lipases, proteases, and are very, very toxic uh, to cholinesterase. And uh, should mention, importantly, that these oxones can be generated in the environment as well. And the reason that I mention that is that all of the safety testing was done with very, very pure thioates. And your genetic variability has more to do with the oxones. And um, in a real exposure, as our colleagues here, Mike Yost and uh, Rich Finsky have shown, and others in California, EPA monitoring and folks in Spain, there's pretty much oxone present in almost any exposure. And since it takes your cholinesterase out about a thousand times faster, at least, than the thioates, if they inhibit cholinesterase at all, any exposure to the oxone is significant. And the, uh, so the paraoxinase will hydrolyze these toxic oxones, uh, chlorpyrifos and diazonoxones, uh, physiologically uh, important, uh, paroxone not. And the nerve agents, while they're hydrolyzed in the test tube, are not important physiologically. Uh, you have to have engineered pond to do that properly. Then they do not require bioactivation. They take you out straight away. So there's a huge genetic and environmental uh, variability to the cytochromes P450. If you're taking certain drugs or smoking dope or cigarettes, your levels may go up very high. Um, and mutation will affect it as well in polymorphisms. And paraoxinase doesn't vary as much environmentally, but it's uh, quite variable genetically. So if we went around the room and measured your pond status today, it'll probably be the same 20, 30 years from now unless you have liver disease. So these are the pond one genetic polymorphisms. And these 200 SNPs were uh, revealed by Debbie Nickerson when Gail Jarvik talked her into sequencing the whole pond genes and looking for genetic variability in uh, 20, 27,000 bases of pond gene in 40 individuals. Um, so the, um, let's see if we find, so in the five prime end, there's some uh, known promoter polymorphisms, quite a few uh, polymorphisms in introns. There are nine exons. And then there are three prime polymorphisms that haven't been characterized and should be. The Q192R coding region polymorphism determines catalytic efficiency to some substrates, uh, to hydrolysis, and not to others. And uh, the minus 108 promoter polymorphism uh, in an SP1 binding site is very important. If, you have, uh, if you're homozygous for C, you're making about twice as much protein on average as if you have T in that position. So there have been recently hundreds of studies carried out uh, looking for a relationship between PON1 uh, polymorphism and disease. And these have looked only at SNPs, and hopefully as we get through this talk today, you'll realize that that's a very, very bad uh, way to go and pretty much a waste of time and resources to look at only SNPs. You could uh, sequence, uh, determine, characterize all these 200 SNPs and still not be able to predict an individual's level, which after all is what's doing the detoxification. So PON1 is a six, the structure is a six-bladed uh, beta sheet propeller structure and uses a retained signal sequence. It's the first protein known to keep its signal sequence on after it's uh, made in the liver uh, as an anchor into the HDL particle. And we can see here the um, blue highlighted residue 192 that, uh, that's responsible for the catalytic uh, efficiency polymorphism. And as I mentioned, this work was all done by Debbie Nickerson and genome scientists and her colleagues. So how do you determine PON1 status? SNPs alone, as I just mentioned, provide no information on PON1 levels, just some wild guesses. So if you measure the rate of hydrolysis of two substrates, disoxone, plot that on the y-axis, and paraoxone, plot that on the x-axis, uh, each dot is a different individual in a population run in triplicate. And that reveals the 192 genotype, a functional genotype. So all of these individuals have arginine at position 192. All of these folks have glutamine. And these are heterozygotes. And you notice a couple of things. 
One, there's a huge variability in the level of uh, enzyme among the three different genotypes. Some individuals having very low levels, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and some people having very high levels, and those are significant. And that's true for all three genotypes. There's more variability in the glutamine folks, probably because of linkage disequilibrium with a promoter polymorphism. Most of the ARG guys are in linkage disequilibrium with a better promoter, the C at uh, the SP1 binding site at minus 108. The other thing you'll see is the homozygotes fall pretty tightly on the line, on a trend line, and the heterozygotes bounce around a lot. And our interpretation is these folks are making more protein off their glutamine allele, and these folks on this side of the line off their arginine allele, guys on the trend line making equal amounts off uh, each allele, but very different levels. And recently we were able to uh, after a lot of work by Becky Richter, uh, develop an assay that uses non-toxic substrates because a lot of folks don't want to use these highly toxic OPs in a, in a laboratory and chance poisoning their technicians. Uh, so if you measure rates of phenylacetate hydrolysis at, low, at high salt against chloromethyl phenylacetate hydrolysis at low salt, you can get the same functional distribution. And it took Becky, I think, 70 different substrates over the years, run at all different pHs and salt concentrations to finally uh, get this assay established, and there are two papers describing it. So what are the consequences of low of variability in PON1 status? And is PON1 a, a valid biomarker susceptibility? How do we know that low levels and high levels have any influence on susceptibility? So. Uh, this work was made feasible by our colleagues at UCLA, Jake Lucis, Diana Shee, and Aaron Tward, who started with C57 wild-type mice and then uh, generated the PON1 knockout, has no PON1 activity at all. And if you measure diazoxone hydrolysis in a knockout mouse, it's absolutely zero in the plasma. And on that background, they then generated uh, humanized PON1 mice, mice expressing the human uh, PON1 transgene, uh, uh, GLEN192, and ARG192. As I mentioned, these were done at UCLA. And these have been invaluable both for their cardiovascular studies, the relationship be be between PON and vascular disease, and tremendously useful for the animal model that uh, Juan Finn began working on uh, some years ago here. So there's Juan Finn. And uh, what Juan Finn found early on was this is a basal level of PON1 in a mouse. And if she injected that mouse IV with purified rabbit PON1, which is extremely active, she could shoot the PON1 level up very, very high. And it was fairly stable. It uh, stayed up with a half-life of five to 10 hours. And we won't have a chance to talk about recombinant PON today, but Stephanie's work and, and Rick Stevens and Toby Colt have shown that if you take the recombinant pond that we make in E. coli, it's active, and if you inject it into a mouse, it's persistent out beyond 48 hours, and it will protect against 3LD50s of pesticide. So it's a very functional protein, and easily measured since the background in the knockout mouse is zero. So what happens when you inject this into uh, a wild-type mouse and measure their brain cholinesterase following a dermal exposure? Uh, mice that do not receive injected rabbit pawn have their brain cholinesterase almost terminally inhibited, whereas the mice receiving the injected rabbit enzyme have their brain very, very well protected. So this uh, not only showed the function of high levels of pawn in protecting against an OP exposure, but at the same time demonstrated the potential of using pawn one for therapy for OP exposure. So these and many related experiments demonstrated clearly that high levels of PON could protect against OP exposures, depending on catalytic efficiency. And what are the consequences of low PON1 levels? So as I mentioned, uh, the UCLA folks generated the knockout, the, uh, took the wild-type mouse and generated the knockout mouse from it. So if you do a dose-response curve, these are dermal exposures of these mice to the indicated levels of either chlorpyrifosoxone or a diazoxone, and you can see it's six mg per kilogram chlorpyrifosoxone exposure, very little inhibition of cholinesterase, brain cholinesterase, four hours after exposure. And with diazoxone, you virtually see no inhibition. And it's quite a different story with the knockout mice. Those same doses killed the knockout mice. 
half that dose, they were very sick, and a quarter of that dose, uh, I mean, half that dose killed them as well, a quarter of that dose, they were very sick. So simply taking this one gene out showed very clearly the role of that gene in protecting against pesticide exposure, along with the earlier experiments showing that the injected enzyme protected. And a big surprise for all of us in the field and in the lab was that uh, the knockout mouse was not more sensitive to exposure to paroxone. It had been thought for 50 years that it would be. So why, why was it not sensitive? So we did some uh, experiments where we took human pawn one, injected it into the knockout mice, and showed that the arge aliform of human pawn one, pawn one arge 192, protected brain and diaphragm very well from chlorpyrifosoxone exposure. And the Glen aliform, uh, human Glen, uh, PON192 purified from folks who were homozygous for Glen, uh, protected but not as well compared with the animals receiving no injection. And these are uh, knockout mice again. And with diazoxone exposure, both aliforms protected equally as well. And for paroxone exposure, there was no protection at all. Uh, correlating with the uh, lack of uh, sensitivity of the knockout, increased sensitivity. So what's the story? So early on, the polymorphism was worked out simply by looking at test tube hydrolysis of different plasma from different humans, seeing that some people had very low ability to hydrolyze peroxone and others very high. And this turned out that Glenn was very low and Arge very high, about nine times more efficient. So it was easy to see the polymorphism in test tubes. And many, many studies were done early on in the 60s and 70s. And then when um, Juan Fin looked at the catalytic efficiency for diazoxone, it was almost equivalent for the two aliforms. Uh, very different KMs and very different Vmaxes, but they balanced out with the ARGE having a higher affinity for OP and uh, probably a little bit better at low levels of exposure at uh, cleaning up the oxone. And with chlorpyrifos, and this sort of explained, uh, did explain indeed, the fact that you could see the polymorphism in the uh, paraoxone hydrolysis, but at uh, catalytic efficiency of just over six, it wasn't enough to protect them against, wasn't fast enough hydrolysis to protect them. Whereas if the catalytic efficiency goes up into the 70s, we got good protection. In chlorpyrifosoxone, we'd found that ARGE protected better, and sure enough, it had higher catalytic efficiency. So all of that fit with what we ultimately learned about the catalytic, importance of the catalytic efficiency, how fast each pond hydrolyzes each OP at a given concentration. So now, if uh, we look at the sensitivity of the various genetic strains, the uh, PON knockout mouse to a, a dose response curve to chlorpyrifosoxone dermal exposure, we see as we knew before, they're very sensitive. And if we look then at the animal expressing the human glen, PON1, uh, they're intermediate in sensitivity, except for high doses, and the ARGE animal, just like we would predict from what we learned from the catalytic efficiency of injection, they're much more resistant. And it's quite interesting if you put the whole human, uh, human pond gene with the regulatory region and all into mice, it follows the mouse developmental profile. It peaks at three weeks. Whereas in humans, the pond activity doesn't come up in children until six months to two years of age. So it's really interesting all of the regulatory elements are conserved. So the next slide illustrates the importance of these observations. Essentially half of the folks in this room are homozygous for PON1, Glen 192. And remember that uh, at, at a high dose of exposure, they're essentially as resistant as a knockout mouse or as sensitive, we should say. So that's a very important point. And um, so uh, the other point we'd mentioned earlier too with the non-toxic substrates, they can now be used to determine PON1 status reliable, reliably. And as I mentioned, this is stable over time. So if you determine an individual's PON1 status, and you know the rates of drug hydrolysis and OP sensitivity, you could predict quite well how fast a given individual in this population, that person or that person, would metabolize a given drug or an OP. And we published tables where you could convert these measurements 
into data clear back into the 1950s. So you can do a lot of interconversion of rates. We don't have those for drugs, and it'll be really interesting to get those one day. And I wanted to mention another uh, potential biomarker that we've seen in vivo. And uh, this is work by Professor Sato in Japan, the uh, world's carboxyl esterase expert. And looking at a few different livers, they found uh, an 18-fold variability in the levels of carboxyl esterase. And this is not a catalytic uh, uh, scavenger. It simply will bind one OP per carboxyl esterase molecule. And so I initially thought that was worthless. If it doesn't hydrolyze it and one giant protein takes out only one OP, it's not going to be very useful. But a visit to Edgewood where they were treating mice with uh, nice OPs such as nerve agents, they found that if they didn't take the carboxyl esterase out first before they did their experiments, it took twice as much agent to kill the mouse. So I was rather impressed with the ability of these carboxyl esterases to scavenge these OPs. So remember also that we talked about PON1 being important in modulating oxidative stress. And this uh, comes home in the next slide. So this is work we did with Gail Jarvik, looking at individuals who had documented carotid artery disease compared with control subjects. And these are, you want to look at each genotype separately, each functional genotype. So all these individuals are homozygous for glutamine at 192. And the patients stacked up at low levels of PON with very few having very high levels of PON and an average difference of about 25% in the two populations, which I didn't expect to see as a single risk factor for carotid artery disease. And the same is pretty much true with the heterozygotes with about a 15% uh, difference, uh, lower levels in the uh, subjects and the patients. And with the arch homozygotes, we don't really have enough individuals there, but we didn't see an effect in these few individuals. And the gene frequency in individuals of northern European origin is 0.7 for glutamine and 0.3 for arginine. So 0.3 squared is about 9% of the population falls into this category of arch homozygotes. This should be repeated in populations of Asian and African origin because the gene frequency flip-flops. It's about 0.7 for arginine, so you'll have over 30% of the individuals in the arch homozygote and 0.4 for glutamine. So that really bears repeating. And I should mention, uh, related to all the hundreds of studies that were done looking at genotype alone, you see no differences in frequencies of the various genotypes. So what about... Uh, genetic and activity variability in the PON family of genes and susceptibility to neurological diseases. So there were a number of reports in the literature suggesting involvement of PON1 in Parkinson's disease. And again, those studies were just based on polymorphism, on SNP analysis, which we already knew was pretty useless in predicting either sensitivity to OPs or sensitivity to vascular disease, and contrary to common sense as well because you know if someone's got a low level of enzyme and it's supposed to be hydrolyzing oxidized lipids, they're going to do it much slower than someone with high levels and should have quite a different influence on uh, disease risk. So we said, well, let's do a proper PON status analysis on a reasonable number of Parkinson's patients. So um, these studies were done in collaboration with Cyrus Sabadian, Harvey Checkaway, and their colleagues. And so the top panel shows PON status in 1,000 individuals, of 900-some individuals, half of which had Parkinson's, half who didn't, half males and half females. And we wrestled with these data for a long, long time. And in, we always ran rates of phenylacetate hydrolysis because it's not affected by the polymorphism and will give you a rate, uh, an enzyme level across genotypes. So if you measure rates of phenylacetate, that pretty much tells you what the pro PON protein concentration is in your plasma, regardless of genotype. So I noticed that these data were spreading out a bit, much more than they did with the diazoxone hydrolysis. So we fooled around with the data a lot. And uh, long and the short of it was, if we measure the ratio of hydrolysis the aryl esterase over the paraoxinase activity on the y-axis. And look at the, the cases and, uh, and the controls. We found 
that uh, in the ratios, everybody above this cutoff, every single individual above that cutoff was a male with Parkinson's disease, and none of them below the lower cutoff. There were overlaps uh, in, the, in the middle of the distributions, except with the ARDS, there were only six people in the overlap in the ARDS homozygotes. So that'll be interesting, again, to look at in Asian and African uh, subjects with Parkinson's. We didn't find the same uh, effect in females. And there, Parkinson's, as you know, has a higher frequency in males, and um, other mitochondrial diseases are occasionally more prevalent in, in male subjects. So our interpretation of these results is the following, that the substrate sites for phenylacetate hydrolysis and peroxone hydrolysis are enough different in the enzyme, they're not nailed down completely, but they were sufficiently different that some years ago they had a conference and um, one investigator insisted that they be classified as two enzymes. They were two different enzymes. And Bert Ledoux's lab and my lab worked very hard to convince this lady that it was carried out by one enzyme. They were collinear on all the plots. And finally, Bert Ledoux showed that the clone pond had both activities. And we'd shown activity stains, so it was finally put to bed. But the sites are different enough that a subtle variation in the HDL particle will change the rates of the two substrates. And that's our interpretation, that we're seeing the inability to modulate oxidative st stress, particularly in males, manifest in a different HDL environment. So we can actually use it to predict uh, males with Parkinson's disease. The other thing I think that it should be interesting, if you're able to develop a treatment that will in, uh, repair or enhance uh, modulation of oxidative stress in a patient's mitochondria, you should see someone drop down from above the cutoff, uh, drop down above the cutoff, down into somewhere in here if the therapy is eff eff efficacious. So as I mentioned, we did, didn't see the same effect in females. So these are just mutations associated with Parkinson's disease, in alpha synuclein PARC and DJ1, PINK1, leucine-rich kinase region, leucine-rich region kinase 2. So all of these, along with the fusion-fission protein mutations, all affect ability to modulate oxidative stress. So that's uh, one of the reasons we come with that interpretation. So another story emerged uh, when we looked at the relationship between genetic variability of the PON1 family of genes and ALS. And this is work primarily uh, done by our colleagues in Boston, uh, John Landers and colleagues, uh, Rob Brown. And in the, when we go back to the study that we'd done on the carotid artery disease, there was one mutation that stood out. This individual genotyped at 192 as a heterozygote by DNA sequencing, but you can clearly see the functional analysis puts them in with the Glenn homozygotes. And so we showed uh, very clearly uh, Debbie sequenced the whole gene, a piece of cake for Debbie to do that, and found there was a pro 90 Lu mutation. And, um, and that then turns up in the ALS patients, um, as we'll see. A number of other mutations turned up as well. And uh, Stephanie has uh, made this construct, expressed it in E. coli, and the protein appears to be very, very sticky. It doesn't purify like normal recombinant uh, wild-type human PON1. So we saw that uh, this turned up in uh, Lander's uh, mutations. So these are um, individuals with familial ALS. These are the coding mutations. LUPRO90 shows up there, and as I mentioned, the we should not, if you take out one gene, you shouldn't have seen the level drop as low as it did in the PON1 status. So it looked to us at that point in time, even before these data turned up, that it was probably a dominant negative mutation. And you see that these, many of these mutations are heterozygous and probably dominant negative mutations. So these are the coding mutations that are seen, and you see them in different families and frequency one in, the, in 260 or one in 166 of the families, and you don't see any of them in the controls of over 1,000 controls. The other interesting thing was that in PON1, PON1, PON2, and PON3 are very, very similar in structure. And, um, oops, if we can find that. So in PON1 and PON2, 
you find mutations in the same residue in the cysteine, in the case of PON1, cystoarge, in case of PON2, cysteine to ty tyrosine, and these, this is a, a cysteine that's involved in a disulfide bond. And also, there in some of the variant ALSs, they, they also turn up in controls. They're enriched in the ALS patients compared with the control population. So we'll skip to another risk function for, for the PONS. And this is, uh, would be related to infectious disease. Turns out that PON1 is involved in the innate immunity system. All the PONS are. And by a way of hydrolyzing quorum sensing factors from bacteria, and this may very well have been the early function of PON1, the lactinase activities. And so the lactinase activities that you see in drug hydrolysis, quorum sensing factor hydrolysis. And as I mentioned, this was work done by uh, Pete Greenberg uh, before and after he arrived here and, and Joe Zabner, uh, who stayed on at Iowa. We haven't recruited him here yet. So if we look at the, uh, the ability, this is the amount of quorum sensing factor left after time. PONS1 and PON3 hydrolyze it quite well, but PON2 even better. So uh, this appears to pull PON into a, to the innate immunity uh, world. And the physiological effects were difficult to see because if you looked at the PON1 knockout mouse, it wasn't more sensitive to pseudomonad lethality. Uh, PON2 PON and PON3 picked it up, and no one has a locust knockout yet. Could be lethal, we don't know why. But Joe Zabner then uh, and crew, uh, Dave Stoltz in his lab, did a really beautiful experiment. We've been using the mouse as a model, which is a fairly expensive model. So uh, they made a transgenic, they put the human transgene into Drosophila. And they found that, that in, in moving that single gene into Drosophila made them resistant, not to the infection, but to the lethality of the infection. And at the same time, they made a pesticide-resistant fly, which I'm sure thrilled the Iowa Department of Agriculture. <laughs> so we'll uh, take a look at approaches for identifying the biomarkers of exposure and hope that uh, we can work together with lab medicine in doing this. Uh, Andy has met with our colleagues from CDC, and they have a quite different reason for doing this for the nerve agents and other, other bad OPs. So uh, we'll take a look at some of the challenges for identifying and characterizing the biomarkers of exposure and some of the progress that we've made on this front over the last uh, couple of years. So currently, we monitor the cholinesterase levels in our agricultural workers, particularly the sprayers and the mixers. And uh, at the beginning, before the spray season, and then during the spray season, and if their level drops to below 60% of their baseline level, they have to come out of the field without loss of wage until their level comes back up to 80%. I think it's a common, I think I want to be pulled out before a 60% uh, level of uh, plasma cholinesterase. And so if you could simply take a snapshot at a point in time and determine what percent of their cholinesterase was modified by exposure, it'd be a much better and more sensitive assay because the cholinesterase levels bounce around a lot. Uh, and if you've got a very accurate measure of the exact amount of their uh, cholinesterase, that was, plasma cholinesterase that was monitored, it would be very useful. As I mentioned, CDC has quite a different mission. This is the uh, results of the... Uh, sarin attack in Halabja, March 16, 1988. There's a sarin molecule. So it's important to be able to identify the adduct on the active sites of serines of your biomarker proteins. And then uh, a few years ago, we were visited by a British and an Australian pilot who were involved in safety studies in the airlines. The Australian pilot had already lost her certificate to fly from OP exposure, presumably, and the British air pilot was very, very concerned about it. He campaigned for years to uh, eliminate the presence of these compounds in the aircraft cabin air. So what happens, this uh, molecule, triarylphosphates, are added to 1% to 3% of the oil volume as high-pressure lubricants. And they do a test, they collar up three ball bearings, spin a fourth one on top, continue to add weight until they literally spin well together. And that can uh, give them the 
lubricating properties of these compounds. But when you're exposed to these, um, you, you oxidize the methyl group adjacent to the phosphate bond in the orthoisomer. That cyclizes and you lose one ring and you generate a compound called cyclic selogen and crystal phosphate. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of these molecules. And there's a, as we all know and talked about earlier, there's a large variability in cytochromes P450. And we know that different individuals have different sensitivities to exposures. So what do we know about this compound? We know that during prohibition, they put this compound, the triorthocrystal phosphate, into extracts of ginger. These guys had the great idea of marketing ginger to get around prohibition, ginger extracts, ethanol extracts of ginger. And the regulators mandated that there be so much ginger content, which would make the ethanol extract bitter and not prone to abuse. Uh, and so the bright idea of these guys putting TOCP in resulted in the paralysis of somewhere between 10 and 50,000 people. So if you look at Ginger Jake syndrome on the web, you'll find lots of songs and poems and stories about paralyzed folks and even uh, Southern saying uh, he's a Jake leg preacher, i.e. a hypocrite who was nipping the booze and paralyzed himself. It took 24 years before a very bright guy, Norman Aldrich in the UK, who did a lot of the early work on paraoxinase, realized this compound these compounds had to be uh, metabolized by liver to be very toxic. And then in 1961, Ito and Cassida, then in uh, Wisconsin, and John is still working in Berkeley in his 80s. I, I called him not long ago and told him I'd heard a rumor that he retired. And he said he did, but he'd just taken on two new grad students. So <laughs> he's not giving up yet. And he's very smart and very productive in this arena. So how do, how do you get exposed to, to these compounds? This will give you an overview of how that happens. This is a story Air from can Channel 4 News, health. London. The links between flying and deep vein thrombosis in passengers is well known. But now there are fears for the health of pilots. A government committee is meeting tomorrow to investigate reports that pilots and cabin crew are being poisoned. Crews believe the air they breathe can be contaminated by chemicals from engine oils, and they accuse the government of ignoring the problem and downplaying the risks. Our science correspondent, Julian Rush, has seen new scientific evidence that suggests pilots have been contaminated by organophosphates. The first officer smelt fumes and discussed pilot with the captain symptoms of neurological problems. The pilots' union, Balpa, has now collected anonymous reports of nearly 800 incidents of fumes or smells. In well, every airliner flying today gets fresh air in the same way. It's drawn in through the engines, where the spinning turbines compress and heat the thin atmosphere. A small proportion of the hot, compressed air is bled off to feed the aircraft's air conditioning system, which is usually around a 50-50 mix of fresh and recycled air. But the fresh air is not normally filtered, so any contamination from leaking oils can form a fine, potentially toxic mist. Worried pilots recently sent... So the uh, issue of that happening, it occurs when the bearing seals fail, and the bearing seals are designed to operate by air pressure, so they're leaking a bit all the time, and different aircraft and different engines have very different uh, properties, the BAE 146 being one of the worst, 757 not being so great, but almost any of the aircraft can have an issue. Uh, some of the worst ones we've seen recently are the uh, from a 767. If you see a tail, tail number 251, don't even get on the plane. Uh, so this is uh, an attendant describing what happened to her after a fairly acute exposure. Other flight attendants and passengers and, and my fact that I wasn't remembering anything. I looked at my hands. I I looked at my hands when we were sitting out in the thing, and I was shaking. And my upper body was shaking, and I I I didn't know why. And so what I ended up, the paramedics were looking at me, monitoring me, and at that point they said this one. This one needs to go to the hospital. So off we went to the hospital, all three of us. 
So Chris Hingles, our Channel 5 news reporter, um, <clears throat> and spent a morning with him and provided him with the House of Lords report on this issue, a paper from uh, Chris Winder in Australia on uh, toxicity of jet engine lubricants, a video done by Captain Tristan Lorraine after he lost his medical to fly on toxicity of cabin air, um, and a number of things related to the uh, jet engine uh, lubricants. And uh, so he ran a segment, including a bit of film from this exposed uh, attendant. And a lady out of Wenatchee saw it and realized she'd flown February 12th, a couple of years ago, and started shaking on the 13th. And so she came in for a blood draw and was sitting beside me in Karen's old office. And she said, Clem, no one has documented my tremors. And her knees were bouncing and her head shaking a bit. So I put the little webcam that was sitting on my computer on and took uh, fourth one minute segments and this is what happened uh, on the fourth segment this is very annoying this is the fourth time this has happened today and it lasts maybe two minutes to three minutes more. So that took about a minute to resolve, and then she calmed down to adjust her head and knees shaking. Um, more recently, January 16th, plane 251, uh, we were just talking about, uh, landed in Charlotte, uh, coming in from St. Thomas, and seven or eight ambulances met the plane, and they took the captain off uh, on a stretcher which I think gives you some concern about, about both your safety, if you want this guy flying your plane, and your own personal health if you want to end up in the same shape he is because you're breathing the same air he's breathing. Uh, the two pilots that were on that flight are still off work, and four of the five attendants are still off work. So it's, it's not a trivial exposure. So in looking, um, and the airlines have been denying it, and so we began to look for biomarkers of exposure, which will be useful not only for the ag workers and for the uh, aircraft employees and passengers, and also for CDC for looking at other uh, serine esterase inhibitors, including nerve agents. So when we looked at uh, butyrocholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase, and monocyte carboxyl esterase, all, all three of these gels, they're activity stain gels, where we're just staining the active protein and not, not just for general protein. We found that uh, uninhibited, we see very nice activity stains. And unlike the pig liver enzyme, the tricrystal phosphate per se doesn't inhibit any of these human esterases, just like Aldrich had noted clear back in the 50s. But if you incubate uh, those enzymes with the cyclic metabolite, they're dead in a doornail. They're absolutely dead. Then we um, looked at another biomarker that Cassett had predicted. He predicted there was an esterase in red cells that could be used to monitor uh, potential for paralysis from these exposures. So we ended up purifying what he'd predicted earlier in another paper would be a good biomarker. That's human red cell acyl peptide hydrolase that cleans up the acylated peptides on the end of proteins. And uh, then did an inhibition spectrum on that and found just like with the other proteins, the tricrystal phosphate straight up didn't inhibit it, but the cyclic compound uh, knocked it dead in a doornail along with this whole host of o OPs. And uh, Dave Goodlett and crew identified this as acyl peptide hydrolase, and Mike McCoss and crew uh, identified the adduct on the active site serine. In this case, we used uh, cyclic phenylsilinogen phosphate um, instead of the crystal selenogen phosphate. So we got a 156 rather than a 170 adduct. So how do you rapidly purify these proteins so that you can analyze them by mass spectrometry? You put, take a magnetic bead and covalently attach the antibody to the target protein, and then um, put a magnet up against the test tube. These are larger than micron sized beads. And you pull 
the magnetic beads containing the target protein off to the wall of the tube, wash the daylights out of them, and then analyze what you, what's come off. And so this is work uh, that Judith, Judith Marsalik, um, Jerry Kim, Becky Richter have been doing for some time. And um, this shows uh, plasma proteins with albumin being the predominant protein and uh, shows in a single step that you purify very, very highly purified butyl cholinesterase and its dimer with only a tiny bit of antibody bleeding off the beads. So you can get a very rapid purification of butyl cholinesterase and then digest it for mass spec. And this shows a couple of very interesting things. This is using the same protocol for human red cell acylpeptide hydrolase. So on one step, you pull it out of a red cell lysate, which is almost all hemoglobin, very, very clean. And um, when we did, this is actually from an exposed individual, but somehow they neglected to carboxymethylate the protein, and we locked, lost the active site peptide, which uh, is a serine-containing peptide, I mean, uh, a cystine-containing peptide. So I mentioned to the postdoc who was doing this, Rick Stevens, said often when you raise an antibody to a human protein in a rabbit, we may, may share enough epitopes with a mouse that that antibody will pull down the mouse protein. And sure as the world, it worked very, very well. This is a mouse, a red cell lysate. These are molecular weight markers. And in a single step, we get a huge enrichment of a protein you don't even see in the original gel pattern. So the importance of this is now that that mouse can be used in an inhalation model uh, because these, these uh, lubricants, lubricants change properties significantly when they're heated. So one can do inhalation experiments with heated oils. So this just shows a sort of a schematic of characterizing uh, the active site uh, adducts on, on proteins. This is uh, a recombinant uh, protein made in E. coli with heavy nitrogen, so you can have internal standards. Um, this I learned from Larry Thomas many years ago when he was working with fish and uh, using uh, tritiated uh, benzpyrene metabolites to correct for uh, C14 fish metabolites for extraction efficiencies. So this, this works quite well. And some people are just using N15 synthesized peptides. So as I mentioned with the pig enzyme, it's taken out straight up with a carboxyl esterase, so we use that for proof of concept. And now we're adding a second step. Um, we take the very pure protein and we're using um, anti-peptide antibodies, so we've got a very pure protein chop it up with proteases, and this is work that Judith Marsalek and uh, Paul Baker and Becky Richter are doing, uh, along with Mike McCoss and uh, Danielle Tomasella, Daniela. And so then you end up with just a very single uh, analyte, quite pure analyte, because it's gone through a double purification. And reason for doing that is some of the adducts are not coming out where we expect them, so we want to be able to very rapidly determine what's happened to that active site peptide. And this just shows the mass spec of the, uh, of the uh, crystal uh, phosphoserine adduct. It adds 170 to the molecular weight of the, uh, uh, of the peptide. So Danielle and Mike have done quite a few experiments with these. And in the case of a pesticide, that would be a monoethyl or monomethyl phosphoserine. And I should mention that uh, we just published a paper with Oxana Lockridge it was the world's expert on butyl cholinesterase. This age is on down further unexpectedly to a phosphoserine. That was totally unexpected. And I talked to Dana Barr recently, and she said she's seen, she's now at Emory instead of CDC, and she says she's seen the same with pesticides. That's quite interesting. So we're almost on time. So to summarize what we've looked over today, we can certainly say PON1 status is a risk factor for OP exposure to specific OPs to chlorpyrifos, chlorpyrifosoxone, diazinon, diazoxone, and I mentioned them as pairs because any exposure, you're going to see both the parent compound and the oxone. And uh, as well as for vascular disease, certainly carotid artery disease and microbial infections, and there's a whole host of papers, unfortunately, looking at pond polymorphisms and relationship to Alzheimer's and ALS and Parkinson's, but you really want to do pond status if you're trying to look at the relationship between pond and those, any, any genetic disease because it's the level that's doing the job. It's the protein in your system, in your plasma, in the pond 2 in your cells. Uh, 
So the very uh, so we found two with our colleagues at Boston that PON2 mutations appear to contribute to ALS risk. And a variation in PON1 status analysis by using the special assays revealed PON uh, Parkinson disease in 41% of male patients. I think that'll be a useful assay. And PON1 status is also important in drug metabolism, which we didn't have time to talk about today. So in doing individualized medicine, if you've got a drug that's metabolized by plasma PON1, since it varies so much among individuals, especially if the metabolism is affected by the polymorphism, with a drop of blood, one drop of blood, finger stick, you can get a person's PON1 status. And you may want to know that. Genetic and environmentally controlled variability in activities, levels of PON1, not so much environmentally uh, as genetic with PON1. The P450s, both genetic and environmentally controlled. Same with the carboxyl esterases and esterase. We know a lot of variants that contribute and presumably to OP sensitivity. Quite a reasonable amount of work's been done on that. And we can safely say that mass spec analysis of the modified target proteins can provide information on both the nature and the extent of the OP exposures that that individual's experienced. And if you're looking at proteins with different half-lives for an acute exposure, so you've got uh, butyrocholinesterase in plasma with an 11-day half-life and acyl peptide hydrolase in, um, in red cells with a 33-day half-life, so if you get a couple of time points, you should be able to extrapolate back to the time of exposure. And the carboxyl esterase, our crew, uh, Drs. Baker and Marcelek and Becky Richter, are looking at adding carboxyl esterase on, and there's carboxyl esterase in your monocytes. We keep most of ours in our liver, but there's enough in monocytes to see and hopefully characterize. Um, and so there are a number of opportunities to add some of these analyses to the lab medicine protocols, and we hope to work together with you guys in doing that. And Last but not least, these are the folks who've contributed to all of this work. Long-term collaboration with Lucho Costa, Juan Finley, Toby Cole for toxicology studies and their assistance. And Becky Richter has been in the lab for almost 30 years now. And Rick Stevens is off to Boston. Stephanie's still here, as I mentioned. And the quorum sensing crew we've talked about. And the mouse genetics uh, we've also talked about by our UCLA crew. And there's a, quite a large crew working on the biomarkers and from uh, Mike McCoss's lab and our lab. And the cardiovascular studies were done in collaboration with Gail Jarvik and Tom Hatsukami. And the Parkinson studies were done by a large number of folks collaborating. And the ALS studies, as I mentioned, mostly by Boston. And have to acknowledge the permission to use films from uh, Channel 4 News London and fact not not fiction films uh, from UK. And this was also supported by grants from NIEHS, some contributions from CDC and EPA. Thank you very much. We might have a couple of minutes left for questions. So, okay. Yes. So, do the actual level HDL correlate with bones? There's a bit of correlation. It's not spot on. So the level of HDL doesn't determine your PON concentration. But if you don't have any A1, if you have an A1 deficiency, you don't see much PON. So A1 helps to stabilize PON and is probably involved in binding PON. So as I mentioned, PON has a hydrophobic leader sequence to punch into the HDL particle. But it also has some helices that are more than likely interacting with some of the HDL proteins, most likely uh, APOA1, and perhaps others. So the idea that if you have low HDL, low oh. HDL cholesterol, low, it doesn't really necessarily correlate with the, low bones activity. A bit, as I mentioned. Okay. So we did that studies a long time ago with John Brunzel, and we did find, I think in the Glenn homozygote, some, not a strong correlation, but some correlation. But it's not a spot on correlation. So is, um, is there any explanation for the, 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 uh, the mutations in ALS that are dominant negative or dominant? Well, I, I think so. Uh, as I mentioned, the recombinant protein that Stephanie's made 
the Lupro 90 version of Pond is, extre is extremely sticky. It seems to stick to a lot of proteins when we express it in E. coli and pull a lot of E. coli proteins along with it. So its properties may be that it's just a very sticky protein, and that would, would be what maybe explains its, uh, its dominance as an autosomal dominant uh, gain-of-function protein. And we'd seen in the uh, individual that we'd looked at some years before that their pond level was very, very low. So we have some work to do in taking that protein and adding it back to mice expressing human PON1 to see if it knocks down the existing PON1. So the rest of the, is, since we have the capability to make the recombinant proteins, uh, we can do most of them presumably in E. coli and we'll see what their properties are. So that'll be very useful. I've got another question. Yes. Um, so uh, I noticed that the, the, the PON genes are on chromosome 7 Q, yes. um, which is commonly deleted in, in many leukemias. Oh, it is. No, it wasn't. That same region? That same region is deleted. Uh -huh. Does it take out CFTR? I don't know. The transporter? Know, but, yeah. uh, that would be there's really. There's a lot of interest in, you know, in, in, in finding can, you know, candidate genes in that region. So I was wondering wow. if you were sequenced. No, we haven't done any leukemia chromosome 7. That would be worth talking about later for sure. And as I mentioned, the PON2 is a very interesting story that's being worked on by Sven Horky in Mainz, uh, Germany. And uh, he's done some very beautiful work showing that um, if you knock down PON2, then it can no longer sequester coenzyme Q10 and protect cells from oxidative stress, so the chemotherapeutics will take out the cancer cell lines. And, and he's looked at quite a few different lines. So it's a very unexpected. And when the quorum sensing factor enters a cell, it seems to immediately kill PON2, both the protein and, the, and uh, blocks transcription in some way. So that's all very, very new stuff and very interesting and very good lab working on it. <laughs> 